So tonight, the Elsie Hillman Civic Forum, um, the title and the theme of today's um, event was about the power of social entrepreneurism and how it can affect social change. And tonight's keynote speaker is someone who has really um, optimized the power of social entrepreneurism to create an international model of how to address food insecurity. Um, you may have seen Leah on the front page of a paper earlier this year helping Billie Eilish's mother get food out of the um, console. And there was another musician, I think, that you were, you were helping. But she leaves no leftovers anywhere. <laughs> and what's that? Yeah. Well, and I was so impressed. I was like, oh my gosh, there's Leah walking with Billie Eilish's mom out of the console center. Um, but Leah is the CEO and co-founder of 412 Food Rescue. And I remember the first time I met her, and she's probably said this a million times since, is that our country doesn't have a food, si or our, our world doesn't have a food supply problem. We have a distribution problem. And she came up with that kind of observation when she was in grad school. And Leah is a graduate of Carnegie Mellon University. Um, she has a graduate degree in public policy and technology from CMU. Um, and um, she took that kind of gem, germ of an idea, a seed of an idea, and created this um, organization that really is a social enterprise um, that utilizes technology and logistics and a civic engagement model um, to fight hunger and promote sustainability by preventing perfectly good food from going into landfills and entering the waste stream and directing and distributing that same food to organizations who serve people in need. Um, she has helped rescue over seven million pounds of food from going into the waste stream um, via a technology that mobilizes over 8,000 drivers in five cities across the country. Um, it's the largest volunteer food transport network um, out there. Um, her mo this model distributes, um, well, I, I think you're gonna probably talk about a lot of this, so I'm not gonna get into your model and everything. Other than to say, Leah's been recognized internationally. Um, she has been featured in national media on NPR, Fast Company, Martha Stewart Living, Food and Wine, Savour. Um, she's uh, got the, um, she did a TEDx in April of 2014 about why the farm is not getting to the table um, and has uh, won lots and lots of awards. So with that, I want to introduce you to one of the most dynamic and um, socially mission-driven people out there, Leah Lizarondo. I hate intros because I feel like I have to live up to them. <laughs> so thanks, Sam. Um, thank you for coming, everyone. This is so exciting. I was asking Sam, you know, like what types of students are here? And Tasha as well, you know, is it mostly political science, mostly school social work? And I was happy to hear it was like all over the place. And I'm so happy about this because I feel like um, sometimes we, you know, when, when, especially with my friends, you know, we stay within our own kind of little silos and not find out what else is going on in the world. So I was happy to see people wanted to be doctors here, wanted to be lawyers. And so for this generation, I'm super hopeful that we're growing, you know, this generation of really well-rounded people. And, and that's what the world needs, among other things. So really happy that everyone's here. Um, okay, here we go. Okay, so I am going to talk about, um, so I loved the discussions today. Um, I sat in this table and heard some of the questions that you guys have and what you asked your mentors. And today what I'm going to focus on really is um, 
social, how do we address, you know, our biggest problems, right? Through maybe looking at it through a different lens. And as I'm saying this, you know, I'm thinking that maybe this is, when I say different lens, maybe I'm talking to not your generation. Maybe you do already look at it through a different lens, especially with what I see with going, that's going on right now. So I'm going to talk about, you know, more specifically, like how we at Food Rescue Hero kind of approach, you know, this problem, this social challenge of hunger. How many of you have heard of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? I'm just curious. Oh, good. That's great. Great. All right, so Food Rescue Hero, Sam talked a little bit about it, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it more, but I'll, first I'm going to talk about myself. So I'm not a Pittsburgher. Um, I grew up in Manila. This is Manila. Manila is the most densely populated city in the world. So it's 110,000 people per square mile. So just to give you perspective here, Pittsburgh is 5,000. New York City, how many can guess? Like, what do you think New York City's density is? On some try. What? Close? 30,000. So if you go to New York City and you feel like people are tight around you, squeeze that in four times. <laughs> That's where I grew up. My children question why I don't have a sense of personal space. <laughs> like, what is personal space? Um, and um, so very, it's, it's not quite, you know, it's not the, the number of people because there's only 1.2 million people in Manila, which is kind of the same population as Allegheny County, um, but everyone is kind of concentrated. Poverty rates in Manila um, are about 20%, so one in five people are in poverty. Um, in the U.S., you know, the official number is around 12% or something like that, depending on how you measure it, in one way you measure it. So, so Manila, very dense, um, tropical, you know, lots and lots of people. Um, after college, so I, I, I lived there till college. I went to college there, I went to business school um, because, you know, as I was telling my table during my time in college, there's only five majors. <laughs> you didn't have all of these permutations of majors, which again is great. Um, and I was, you know, put on the business track. Um, and then when I graduated from college, um, I, you know, about a few years later, I realized a dream that I had when I was 16 of moving to New York City, and I did. So I am a first generation immigrant, and I worked for a Fortune 500 company called Koei Palmolive. And I learned a lot. It was a big eye-opening five years of my life. I learned about why I buy the things I buy and how companies basically study us. They study us so well that for me it was the most fascinating experience because when you get your Instagram ad, you like your Instagram ad. And there's a reason why you like your Instagram ad because they know you. You know, when you buy this soap that you use and this particular soap that you use on your face that you won't use any other soap, it's because they know you. And, and in that sense, it scared me, but it also fascinated me. And it became, you know, the beginnings of a time where I started thinking about what if this power was used for something else aside from making so much money? Um, and so I moved to Pittsburgh, not um, really to my own volition. I was engaged in following someone who was going to Pitt. And so I said, well, I'm not doing anything, so I'm going to go to Carnegie Mellon. So I went to CMU. And really, in, it was a choice between business school and the School of Public Policy. And why did I choose the School of Public Policy? Because I knew nothing about the public sector. I knew nothing about nonprofits or government or why business has such a pejorative view of government and nonprofits and why they think it's slow. And yet, it's, it's, the, it's who serves everyone. And so I wanted to learn why. I wanted to learn how these things work. What is policy? What is law? And, um, and, and it was the best time of my life, too. And I learned a lot about how we finance things, public finance, 
how we pass laws, you know, um, which is not really any different than products. You know, why do you think they name laws? Because they know you won't read the law. <laughs> you'll just read the name and you'll vote on the name. And so they're selling a law to you. Everything is all about that. It's about engagement. And that's how I, that's the lens I see the world. And so after I graduated, um, I went to Innovation Works, worked for Deloitte, worked for a venture capital firm and for a big advertising firm. And this was a, an old presentation, but kind of showed the ups and downs. You know, so you all are all just in college. It's not a linear path. It's going to be a path that's, you know, goes all over the place and that's okay. But one of the things I really, really um, value and, you know, when my kids ask me, you know, why are you never bored? I am really, truly never bored. And I tell them it's because I'm constantly curious. I am always asking questions. I always want to know why. I always have a follow-up question about something. When you're telling me something, something already clicks in my head, you know, in terms of, oh, this is what I'm going to ask you. So I hope that if I leave you with one word today that you will remember, I hope it's that word. And if you all approach life as you go with extreme curiosity, well, A, you'll serve yourself by never being bored, but B, you will look at things in ways that maybe hopefully, even if it's just one thing, that it's not the same way that other people look at it. Okay, so I'm gonna start with a question that someone asked me in an interview one time. Um, why do new products, services, companies, and campaigns happen? There's really only about four, five answers to this, and it's probably not gonna change. There's competition, so when you're, you have a service, and I'm talking about for profits here, you want to defend yourself. Um, you have a tiny share of the market, you just want to eat a little bit more of the pie. There's new markets that you're creating. Um, you want to increase sales. You want to improve margins, whatever the reason is, but these are mostly the reasons. Um, but whenever you have any of these objectives, what you do when you're figuring out what to do next, what new company, if you're, if you're, un, you know, if you're a budding entrepreneur, you saw something in the market, you're always looking for this word. How many of you know what the definition of latent is? Yes. Any tech people here? Tech people? Good. What's latency in the tech world? Yeah. Slow, because it's, it's, the, it's actually, that's one way to put it. It's usually put in a pejorative um, way, but it's, latency is the potential. It's the potential before data gets passed and passes through. And the speed at which, at which it passes is what's called latency, right? So latent is like a potential. It is something that's hidden. And when you are seeing a need in the market, let's say Sloan here saw a need um, to respond to refugees, there was a latency. There was a latent thing that no one was responding to. Um, if you introduce a new product, whether it's, I don't know, like uh, the new, a new toothpaste. Why would you introduce a new toothpaste? I mean, why, why do we improve toothpaste in general? There's really nothing to improve with toothpaste. But what happened there was they realized that, you know, there are people who care about whiteness of their teeth more than they care about sensitivity. So then... There's that latent little thing in us about whitening our teeth. So they'll introduce a toothpaste just for you. And that's the latent need. Right. So, so now we see problems, right? So problems are really potentials. Right? Then I want you to also begin to look at problems not as problems, but, but something with potential. And so I'm going to talk about the problem that we solved, and I'm going to tie this all together using food waste. So Sam talked about, you know, the big glaring problem. We waste almost half our food supply. I think a lot of you know that we waste some food, 
But when I read this, I was like, almost half? That's insane. 63 million tons, the number one material in landfill, causing most of the methane in landfills, the most dangerous greenhouse gas. So even if you're not food insecure, wasting food affects you. We, did, we waste 50% more food than we did in the 70s. It's so easy to get food now. 20% of all the land and the water that's used to grow food will grow food that will never be eaten. Talked about this, it's, um, the, if it were a country, it will be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter, second only to road transport. But then most immediate moral disconnect is that on the other side of that, we know so many are food insecure. It is so much so that it is SDG2. So what is hunger? What is food insecurity? So in, in the United States, one in 10, 34 million people are food insecure. So that is kind of, if I use kind of a market parlance, that's your market. And 6.5% use a food pantry, 3.5% do not. That's 12 million people. So when you talk about food waste, I'm going to go back to food waste again. 97% of food that goes, that is perfectly good, you know, goes to landfill when it could be used to feed people in need. So how do we get this potato, which is one of the ways, the, one of the reasons why food goes to waste? Um, for those of you who are, I wouldn't know, like ag majors, I suppose, the USDA has a grading system for food, I didn't know this. Do you know why your green beans are all the same size? Because they pass through a thing that's the same size, and if they don't pass through it, they're not grade A. And so they get rejected. Green beans do not grow the same size in nature. So it gets thrown out. And so it's a choice between this and actually feeding someone in need. So um, I'm not going to go through a lot of these, but then, you know, looking at the problem, who are business majors here? Business majors? Business majors? Okay, operations research, the best subject, <laughs> made me cry. But then you start to look at problems and try to understand why is this happening? Where, why is food going to waste and where is it going to waste? Sadly, most of it is because of us at our house. You know, how many of you bought a bag of salad with really good intentions? Right? We all do it. Um, but the next is consumer-facing business. And what that means is this, this university, grocery stores, events, institutions, that's where half of the 40%, almost half of the 40% happen. And sadly, it's mostly fruits and vegetables, about 52% of it. And that's what people in poverty mo have difficulty accessing. So then the question now is, how do you then cost effectively recover food from this, right? Because no one values this food. No one's going to buy it. Nonprofits won't buy it. They don't have the money to buy the food that's going to waste. The grocery stores aren't going to pay for the transport of bringing it to a nonprofit because that doesn't make them any money. There's no money here. And so, but there is awareness. You know, the difference between now and eight years ago is now there's shame, right? People are more aware of food waste now. And so, you know, everyone's saying they're going to donate. Starbucks, I'm going to use Starbucks as an example, did great, I'm going to say greenwashing, but um, sorry, <laughs> Starbucks did it, but then they used an old model that is extremely costly, trucks. Who's paying for the trucks? Charity can pay for it one time, maybe a few years. Then you have to maintain that truck. And now the nonprofits have to maintain the truck for food that has no value, that they can't really plan against because you don't know what's going to be in it that day. So you can't say, I'm going to feed 200 people using only surplus food because you don't know sometimes you'll just get 200 pounds of bread. 
So you can't plan against surplus foods. You really have to change the way you look at things if you want to tackle the 63 million tons of food that goes to waste. This is five years later. Okay, so we said, I, we think we know how to do this. We think we know how to create a transport network that is not going to cost a lot of money, but is going to be effective at recovering some of this food and redirecting it to nonprofits. So someone, and then we did, and then we got told no. <laughs> so how many of you know CoStar? I love CoStar. <laughs> so we proposed the idea, and we got said no, 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 that doesn't work. We don't work that way. That's my favorite phrase. That's not how it's done. We don't do that. It can't be done. So if ever you hear that, even if you work within a corporation, within an institution, see that as an encouragement or a challenge, depending on how you are. And then still try. See no, not as a stopping point, but as an encouragement to keep moving forward. So when we talk about how Starbucks approached it, right, we are going to tackle this big problem of 63 million tons of food going to waste. But we're going to keep on doing how we used to do things. It's, it's not with the perspective that we need. So the, I love this quote. I, mean, I don't know if you've seen it. So this is one reason why. How many of you can tell me or guess what this is? No, good. It's the Walmarts in the US. I know. So you know where you want to live if you don't want to be overrun by Walmart. Um, why it's, it's difficult to recover because it's highly distributed. So for tech folks and business people, like it's like, it's a highly distributed network. It's just, there's too many locations. So, so, so many. For the statistics people, it's a long tail. It's the long tail of the distribution. The long tail is an interesting problem. So for, again, for tech folks, like that technology is so good at. You know, for instance, you know, the old model which is trucks warehouses, is the beginning of that distribution. This is also how we do business. Let's talk about Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble is that. Amazon is the long tail. It's an endless shelf of many, 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 many things. Barnes & Noble is a big location with a few things, right? So this is a big problem because you can't possibly, using trucks, recover all of that food. Also, trucking won't be able to retain the freshness of the food because it's food that needs to be used right away. So in a traditional logistics model, you then have to truck it to a warehouse where it gets picked and then trucked again, go to a different warehouses before it gets someone in need. By that time, it's a week. This is why most food that we take from big warehouses are food that no one else wants to take. And the expiration date, it can be a week out. Without 412 Food Rescue, that food will be thrown away. So it's not appropriate for small quantities, unpredictable frequency, food that needs to be consumed right away. So how many of you watch Pulp Fiction? I have so many pop culture references. This is the wolf. I love the wolf. He's the cleaner. He solves problems. So what's the solution? What if we cut all of that and make it one step? Is that possible? It's possible because you do it every day, almost. You guys get Ubers, door dashes, whatever else, other things that cuts the middleman and gets the food straight to you. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of you without the need for Pizza Hut, for McDonald's, to buy one delivery vehicle. And yet you get that food every single day. So what if we use that model and say that we're going to take this same technology and then use it for surplus food? 
So we did. So Food Rescue Hero is that tech. It's essentially the DoorDash for food surplus. And in 2016, we launched that technology. 412 Food Rescue used it in Pittsburgh. And it's not seven, it's 100 million pounds of food. Five years, five years later. So 100 million pounds of food in five years through this network. And what's beautiful about it is that everyone is a volunteer. This is where I lose people. What do you mean volunteer? How is that sustainable? Did you know that 60% of firefighters are volunteers? And it's still an industry that works pretty well. And if I ask each one of you today, if you will take food from here to something down, charity down the street, you will probably say yes. So you multiply yourselves by thousands. So it is possible. So it's the largest volunteer food transport network. This is Vince. He is our number one volunteer. He's a retiree. He takes Velfies. He's 72 years old. He has a pickup truck. And he's on our app like a fast, you know, the quick on the draw takes all of the rescues. It's an engaging way to do something for each other. It's Pokemon. And I love this tweet. I told them how she should sign up for four because, and then <laughs> they say they're there. So it's, it's, it's a model that uses the same principles that people who sell us things uses. So what we do is we take your potential, your latent desire to be there for your neighbor, but you have all these complaints, I do, I don't have time, I don't know what to do, I can't plan four hours of my life, we'll make it convenient. What's more, we'll be on your phone and bother you with these little notifications telling you that there's bread from the market or from the towers or, you know, the towers, you know, has three trays of lasagna, can you take it down the street? You'll probably say yes. And so, the other challenge after we did it in Pittsburgh is now how do we take this model and move it and make sure everyone has access to it? You know, so one of the things that makes something sustainable is that if you can scale it, right? How do you now scale this? What's so great about DoorDash is that it costs the marginal cost of adding another delivery vehicle is guess what? What is the marginal cost? Who is accounting here? Variable cost, what is it? Yes, zero. You could have an infinite number of delivery vehicles and each one of them cost you zero because you're not buying them. You only have fixed costs and that's the beauty of that model. And so you can scale. We have one technology that can absorb 10 users, 10,000, 100,000 users. Right now we have about 40,000. So now we are, we're in about 25 cities, 100 million pounds of food, 400,000 trips, um, 35,000 food rescue heroes on call, each one of them missing only 1% of all of the available food out there. They are very reliable. You know what Uber Eats response rate is? 95. So our goal is to be 100 cities by 2030, 1.3 billion pounds of food by the end of this decade. Equivalent to Jeff Bezos flying to the moon 6,500 times in case you want the carbon impact. So, but this model solves another latency and this one we didn't design, this one we discovered. Med school people? Okay, one of the things I love, well, a term that I learned, um, you know, dating this person that brought me to Pittsburgh is comorbidity. All right, comorbidity is something that exists right next to it that you may not see. So we talk about food deserts a lot, and we know people who are food insecure are in poverty. We don't talk about transit deficits. We don't talk about transit deserts. We don't talk about how are people going to get to food that they have a right to, right? Food support. And 
25% of people in poverty don't have cars, in Allegheny, 14%. So a lot of people who need food can't get to food support. So 3.5% who do not access a food pantry. So that is, if there's a market opportunity there, the first market opportunity is it's that. So it's an extraordinary opportunity to change how we enable food access. How many of you have heard of human-centered design? It's great. Yes. So product market fit. Um, this is a food box. It's about how many pounds? There's beans, there's lentils, there's canned goods. You have to carry that. If you're a senior taking a bus, a mother with children, I have a car and I don't take my little kids to the grocery store. How are you going to take that box? Very hard, almost impossible. And if you have a bus that only comes once a day and you miss it, or the food pantry closes to you, closes at 3.30, one of the projects that we had at CMU was looking at the times food pantries are open. Most of them close right when kids get off school. It's not human-centered. We need to do more in terms of capturing the 3.5%. We need to get to know them in the same way I used to study people and their bathing habits. We need to know, we need to walk in people's shoes so we know what actually we need to do to be able to get them to get to us. We need to see them as customers, not as people we help. And our success is in how they're accessing our service. So then we created a network that was an accident actually, um, that brings food close to people. Because most of the traditional food access networks, when we were pushing out this food, couldn't take the food anymore. Their shelves were full, their fridges were full, and there was no other banana that would fit in there, or bread. And so, which makes sense, because this food used to be getting thrown away. There's no storage for it. And so we had to create new networks, family support centers, senior centers, universities, you know, so that we could actually have a place to bring this food. So it's not only the food rescue part, it's also the distribution part that is an important part of this model. So we went to housing sites, which was revolutionary at the time, but Really, why is it revolutionary when Amazon has used it, right? They, you've seen those lockers, right? If they can do that, why can't we do the same thing? Why can't we distribute everything in housing sites? And to this day, the, the big housing authorities of all of the counties of Allegheny and the surroundings are, are still our biggest partners. And then home delivery, which we all know happens for us, right? The conveniences, I don't, I don't have to go to a grocery store anymore. Because we have so many drivers, we can make it happen and we did make it happen during COVID when a lot of people couldn't go anywhere. So this whole innovation started with an idea and everything else happened maybe accidentally, but Every step of the way, what you discover is a new latency and a new latency and a new latency. And the big challenge is for you to keep on going and figuring out until you get to somewhere where you feel like you can stop. All right. So we measure what matters. So that's the other thing. When you're doing something, have the courage to measure what matters. Right? I can say 100 million pounds of food, but does it actually work? So what we did was we surveyed residents of the housing sites that we work with, and we asked them, does it actually work? Do we alleviate food insecurity? So we used the USDA survey. So this is a letter from 
the housing authority of the city of Pittsburgh when we started working with them. Over the course of six months, they received zero referrals for families without food, ending all of the emergency calls for food in housing. And then we surveyed residents, and we used the USDA survey for food insecurity, not our own, and we worked actually with the University of Pittsburgh to make this happen. And we see that 90% of the people we serve have improvements in food security. So this is also measures that we don't see. So that's what Food Rescue Hero is. So it's um, looking at a problem not quite as largesse, not quite as a program, not quite from your perspective as the person who is solving the problem, but really trying to understand who you're trying to get to and hearing them and seeing them and designing products for them, right? So that the language needs to change. So this is um, just a little bit on, on greenhouse gases. But I think what I want to leave you today is that, you know, the perspective is we can't keep on working from the same sets of models and assumption that we have been, assumptions that we have been working on for many years. And from what I'm hearing from the students that were at our table and from what you're studying and the perspectives, the multi, the varied perspectives that you want to have, there's a lot of hope that this generation is going to look through problems, at problems with a different lens. So innovation is beautiful, it's game changing, it solves problems, it's progress, but if it doesn't really benefit the people that you're trying to serve, if it doesn't benefit all of us, then it's not quite radical or revolutionary. It's actually a, a meme that I saw, and I've always hung on to that. So as you go about your life, you know, when you are trying to solve, when you are becoming a lawyer in public health, you know, Mirabel was talking about how come we're not reaching people? And it's because we're not talking to the people that we're trying to reach. I don't know if I want to go through these slides because they're a little feisty, but <laughs> it's for another presentation. But um, these are just things that I want to maybe leave you with, okay? All of you are seeing problems and you're seeing possibilities and you might not think that you can do something about it. You know, one of the things that I kept on hearing when people asked me what I do is that, you know, I, you know we, we take food from restaurants, surplus food from restaurants and give it to charities. And half the time I'd say, oh, I've always wanted to do that. You know, I thought of that. Or, you know, I'm so glad someone's doing that. I'm sure you have an idea that you think is crazy. You do, you all do. And you think it's impossible, oh, I can't do that, who am I? You know, just, just keep it in the back of your head. Don't unsee the idea, and then one day, you know, maybe the day will come that you'll actually take that first step. <laughs> if you try to, that's what happens. If you watch The Matrix. So, that's it, that's all I want to leave you with. at the LC Home and Civic Forum, I did hear a number of students today that said, um, I'm not sure how these fields of study connect. And Leah said the same thing today in her presentation that I mentioned at our table today is, ask yourself what you wanna learn next. Where's your curiosity? And so with curiosity, we're opening the floor for Q&A. Does anyone have any questions for Leah? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes. Yeah, and that's that one of us. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Hi, um, I feel like a lot of the time in organizations like this, a big critical question or critical concern is whether you have people taking advantage of these kind of programs. And I'm wondering if that's an issue that you've run into, and if so, how you've overcome that or implemented policies to work through that. Right, yeah, we get asked that because we work with, most of the locations we work with don't ask for qualifications. And I think the people who mostly ask that question, um, are people who have never probably needed anything. And you all have needed something at some point. We all have, pro you know, we don't always want to ask for help. So imagine that as, you know, you going, taking the trouble to get a bus, you know, go somewhere and pretend you need something. You probably need it. <laughs> So that barely happens. And I think that uh, I'm not going to go into politics, but OK. <laughs> Hello? Is this work? Hello? Hello? Yeah. OK. Um, thank you so much for speaking. That was really fascinating. Um, Something that I've heard a lot, uh, especially when I was growing up, um, was that a lot of the time innovation won't happen unless there's a monetary incentive. Um, and I think you're talking a lot about how about like innovation driven by curiosity. Um, could you talk a little more about like how we might be able to like I don't know make innovation that isn't just motivated by money a thing that is more common in this country maybe. Yeah, so when you say innovation won't happen unless there's money, the way I would see that question is that it depends on who you are, right? So if you, you know, want to have a career, you know, solving big challenges, it's all about you because it's either you're going to be innovative or you are not. But it's your own intent that is the beginning of it, right? So, and I think another way to look at that question is how do we pay for this, right? Is that mostly what it is? It's, okay, so I guess I'm going to first, you know, just get it out of the way that if you're looking to be Jeff Bezos, you're not going to be serving, you know, the 90% of the population, right? That it needs um, support, needs, it doesn't have the same privileges that we may have in this room or Jeff Bezos. Um, so I think part of the way, you know, social innovation is happening and really truly an irritating question I get from philanthropy is, you know, how is this sustainable? Meaning, they're looking for a market model within a nonprofit model. So I'm not gonna go back to market failures and Adam Smith and why nonprofits happen and you know why government is needed, but there's a market failure here and philanthropy is asking for a market solution. So that's, you're going to hear that a lot. What they're worried about is that, are you going to ask us for money forever? So I can say this because I actually am leaving a CEO for one too, so I can be more honest now. Um, so it's, we do have a market mechanism. We actually license our technology. 
So in our financial modeling, by 2030, when we reach 100 cities, we will be fully supported by licensing. It's the market model that everyone wants. Um, is this possible for everyone? No. But we need people like you to still look at the world with an innovative lens, even though the objective is not that single bottom line. And that's where the world really needs to change, is for people to know that innovation is possible and it doesn't have to be driven by profit. I'm bringing you one. Here I come. <laughs> he has the mic first, and then you can uh, bring it. Should I speak? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, I, I don't know if you know this, but do you know what's the plan for all the uneaten food here? I'm sorry? Do you know what's the plan for all the food that isn't going to be eaten here? That's an embarrassing question that, you know, I don't know the answer to, but what I will say is that we do collect from all of the lunch and food services in University of Pittsburgh, probably not at this event. But what I have seen at college events is, you guys need to take it home. <laughs> they need to have these takeout containers and I know you guys would want free food. Heck, I'll take it home. There you go. Yay! Pitt also has the food recovery heroes if you want to join them. Yes, thank you. Um, hi. Uh, to go back to your statement about licensing yeah. and also knowing that you're in, it looks like almost two dozen cities now, I'm wondering what is that process for you and what are how did you start to use new resources and new places since you grew out of out of Pittsburgh. How did we go to 25 cities? Is that what your question is? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, you started here in Pittsburgh and now you're in these new places that probably weren't as familiar with. So how did you tap into the resources in these new places? Yeah, so, um, well, um, so it's, it, first of all, the awareness for food waste has grown in the last eight years. You know, when I started um, this eight years ago, and I would say, do you know that 40% of food gets wasted? Lots of people didn't know, and now most people know. And that's, a, that's the truth for everywhere. Legislation is also catching up. California just passed this landmark law, SB 1383, that actually makes food waste illegal. And so these businesses now have to find a way to redirect food waste. So Mark, California is our, one of our biggest markets. We have, I think, four partners all over California. So in a way, the awareness for food waste is kind of driving the market for us. Um, and when you have laws, you know, you can't pass a law without a way for paying for the law. And so because now California passed this law, then there's funds to actually use towards redirection of food, and that's what we access. So um, this is a, an operational question. So, um, some scientific reports suggest that many manufacturers label their food by uh, best buy date, not expiration date. Have you considered that in your program? Yeah, so there's actually um, legislation that's going around now. It's bipartisan. Um, and it addresses the food date labeling because it is not regulated in the US. Um, there's only one food. This is one of the fun facts that I, I found out early on. What is the only food that has regulated date labeling? Not milk. Those are fake. Don't go reaching in the back of that milk fridge. I know you do. Huh? No, it's baby formula. And not because it goes bad, because it's dehydrated powder. It's because the nutrition degrades. It's the only, so none of the dates that you see in packaging, don't trust them. 
the manufacturer is putting a one week expiration date because they want the product to be tossed because you're not gonna buy it once you see it, right? So then they can sell more product. Be an educated consumer. <laughs> I just wanted to know how you overcame those obstacles because obviously nothing is linear and there's always going to be obstacles that come in the way of achieving our goals um, and achieving something especially as big as what you are doing. So how did you like overcome those? Did you have support with you or did you, you know, go from baseline and then restart up again? Yeah, so I think it helped that I was very ignorant about the process. So I didn't know what the rules were really. I'm not in from the nonprofit world. Um, and so I didn't really know what I shouldn't be doing. So I guess that's a good piece of advice for myself too. And for anyone, it's like, once you see rules, just pretend you didn't see them. <laughs> you know, and I'm sure you've all heard, you know, ask for forgiveness, not permission. And it's really with that. And so I kept going because I didn't know I wasn't supposed to. I think this will be our last question, unless someone desperately likes another question asked. Anyone? Anyone? Oh, right. My slides. Uh, so, for one, I, I highly admire what you're doing, and I just think it's outstanding. Oh, All right, I, I was I was saying I highly admire what you're doing. I think it's outstanding. Um, as you said, you have this uh, expanded quite far, which I think is also outstanding. In fact, you've been able to expand this program. However, I wanted to ask, um, do you think this system would be as effective uh, in the rural areas uh, where people are have to drive longer distances, there's less public transportation, um, and oftentimes these rural areas have people where th there really is not a, there's, there's, there's a very, very poor populace with, uh, there's no one really at the top. Whereas in cities you kind of have a hierarchy and those who can lend their time are in the middle or upper classes Whereas in these rural areas, they're really only just a working class and a lower class. Uh, do you think this model would be sustainable there? Or do you think you'd have to make changes uh, with it or would it have to be overhauled completely? Yeah, it's not going to be the same um, because you won't have the density that you need because the way this works and the way Uber and DoorDash works is, you know, you have 10 times more drivers than there is need, you know, often until you get to surge pricing. But yeah, so that's the kind of theory and that, doesn't really exist in rural areas. I have one more last question. Okay. Just trying to breeze through my side to see if there's. She's, she's an honor scholar with the Pittsburgh Community Food Bank, so. I don't know if this is gonna be a great question, but um, you had mentioned earlier kind of changing the language you use around the people you're serving instead of like referring to them as people you're serving referring or like seeing them more as customers and the service you can provide. And I thought that was really interesting, but I was wondering if you believe there's anything potentially lost in that change of language as well in terms of like how we approach service and traditional models of service and those kind of community relationships that can be built and kind of just the legacy of service and changing that to a more like kind of business <laughs> uh, perspective. Yeah, so I'm not looking at it in the sense of, you know, look at it when I say customer. Mostly when we look at customers, we want to know what we can take from them. Um, the way I want to look at it is we want to reach our customers as easily as possible, make, the, make it as easy for them to buy more of what we have, right? So it's accessing what we're trying to do. So the first assumption there is you're providing a product or a service that is actually relevant to them, right? And then secondly, making sure that it's easy for them to get that product or service. So the business perspective of that is, you know, I will have, you know, if I'm Apple, I, you bought my phone, let's see how much, how, how fast I can make you get an iPad too. And you know, I'm not going to make any of the connectors compatible with anything else. So you're going to buy my connectors too. 
And then my phone will degrade after three years. So you're going to buy more of my phone. I do understand you, but I really want you to get, I want to get more out of you than anything else. Okay, okay great. So I'm just going to leave you with kind of that question on innovation. This is one of my favorite quotes, Angela Davis. You have to act as if it was possible to radically transform the world and you have to do it all the time. That's just the thick skin you have to develop. <laughs> I love this one. I, don't, I haven't looked up that guru. His name sounds sketchy, but I'm sure he's the real deal. But this is a meme that I love, actually. The middle path is just your comfort zone. Neither this nor that. You can choose to be comfortable. You know, have, you know, a very predictable, easy path. But it can also mean you're a full-time bullshitter. <laughs> Don't be a full-time bullshitter. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight for our Never Spectator event. I hope everyone enjoy meeting and talking to the community mentors at your table. Students, make sure you ask for business cards. Also, um, take your time on leaving or connecting with our mentors. We do have some LC booklets on the table as well. But I hope everyone enjoyed themselves tonight. I hope everyone learned something. I know I did. So thank you again and have a great evening. <laughs>